Broadcast is live. Yes, we have not done a YouTube live in, I believe, well over a year. And for all you guys joining in here, I'm Joe Simons, like Diamonds, one of the co founders here at Salt Strong. And here's the backstory of how this is all happening. We have a fellow Salt Strong Insider member, Rich Natoli, a lot of you guys know is Fat Dad Fishing. And he has been a member for years and years and years and has approached us multiple times about doing tips for the Northeast in particular. And we, we did a couple and we're always like, man, we still have just so much going on, you know, from Texas to kind of Virginia, which has really been the main market. But now this year with smart fishing spots and just the explosion of this uh, Salt Strong Insider Club, we just surpassed 35,000 members here in our private club. That whole area, I mean, past, you know, Maryland and up in, in Jersey, it is just absolutely exploded. And we've done a few things with John Skinner, a couple courses, and, and that whole area is just absolutely exploded for us. And uh, we didn't really have, you know, a, 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 a pro or a fishing coach, as we call them here at Salt Strong. And so, Rich, uh, just it, it all worked out perfect. The guy has just been constantly helping out and just a constant just amazing person inside our private online community. And uh, so we gave him a shot and we we're talking about, hey, man, like, what else do you want to do? And he's like, well, you know, I do have my my Monday at 8 p.m. podcast slash YouTube lives anyway that I could put that on the Salt Strong channel and, and start serving some of those those members. And uh, we said, absolutely. And so this is the very first one. We got a really special guest, Frank, who's going to talk about I know some of you people in Florida are probably like a blackfish hog. What are, what are they talking about? But obviously a very, very, very popular fish. And I'm being a little facetious there. I'm pretty sure even all our members here in, uh, in Florida and Texas know what that is. Maybe never caught one before, but uh, I'm really, really pumped to learn a whole lot more about it. And so I, uh, I think it's just me right here. I don't know where Rich and Ed Frank, there's somewhere back. Well, there. I'm here. There he is. There's the man. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yes. Uh, so for the, there are some people watching the live stream right now that I do recognize from the previous show. So welcome to everybody in the chat and welcome to everybody who is not chatting but are watching. Um, Joe, this is awesome. I'm very, very happy to be here. I, I'm, and, I'm, I'm really pumped you're doing it. And, th and what was funny is so we did a private call with all the other fishing coaches, you know, the Tony Wyatt and Justin Richard and that whole crew and Matt and the Yak. And they're hearing about this and everyone's like, well, I, I kind of want to do that, too. So I have a feeling that you'll see a whole lot more of these live YouTube calls where we'll probably have a, a special guest like like we have here uh, today to talk about a specific species or a specific area. So let us know in the chat what do you guys want us to cover, if it's a certain species or a, or a certain expert that you want us to have on here next. Please do uh, let us know. We're going to be going through that as a team uh, tomorrow afternoon. So whatever you guys have in the chat, we will be seeing it. So please let us know wherever it is uh, on this uh, on the screen. Uh, let us know exactly what you want next, because uh, these are fun. Uh, we haven't done this, like I said, in well over a year. And uh, and this got the whole team pretty fired up. So I appreciate you, Rich, uh, you know, coming up with the idea to, to bring this over on the Salt Strong channel. It's going to be good. Yeah, I, I'm excited. And uh, let, let me bring on to the stream right now. Ed Gobo, who is uh, <laughs> the lovely and talented. I, I, I got to keep the cheesy wave. <laughs> yes. so Ed is Ed is the co-host. Ed and I have been doing these for about a year together. Uh, and I guess, what, 50 some, 50 some uh, different live streams. Yep. And we're excited to, to uh, have our guest coming back tonight to talk to us. And uh, we are going to have, uh, in just one moment, I'll bring him on, Frank Mahalik who is just a legendary, he, he denies it, but he is a legendary blackfish fisherman. Blackfish, for those that are unaware, blackfish, tautog, tog, white chinners, they're all the same. They are that beast of an ugly fish that is so beautiful to the mid-Atlantic and northeast fishermen. And it is just an outstanding target, uh, especially in the fall, into the winter, and the spring. And Frank is just known for his ability to get on them, catch the really nice ones. And he's also... Uh, so well thought of that he designed for Century Rods, their Century Pro Togger fishing rod, which, as I like to say, has quickly become the standard rod to use. And uh, 
now people are starting to use it for other species because they realize the versatility behind that rod and uh and frank he'll he'll be talking a little bit about that so uh with that let's bring frank mahalik onto the screen frank welcome it's good to see you thanks guys good to be here welcome man this is uh this is awesome it it's uh it's open in uh in various states new york in particular i believe opened this past weekend so we have the entire new york crowd just chomping at the bit to get out there uh i think the weather was okay this past weekend but they're looking forward to better better weather so why don't we dive right in and talk a little bit about the opening and what to expect in tog season as as the seasons start to open now in new jersey it doesn't open for a few more weeks but what what should people be expecting when they're jumping out onto the water uh, for the first opening of the official TOG season? Well, Jersey, I mean, Jersey, the this, this season runs in April. And the month of April, we're usually fishing out at the reef sites or beyond. It's not really anything happening inshore because the water temps are too cold. But usually in the fall, when the kids go back to school in Jersey, there's an insane inshore bite of blackfish, usually around that time, first week of September, Point Pleasant Canal, all the backwaters inshore behind Margate, Longport. Every rock pile is going to have blackfish all over it. Um, it's, it's a nice shallow water fishery, but that makes it insanely difficult because as many little fish as there are around, you want to use lighter tackle. You want to drop a jig down. But when you're fishing inshore in very shallow water, there's such strong currents that it's very hard to fish jigs inshore. That's why most of the guys that are fishing inshore up in Rhode Island and in Connecticut, they're fishing in that shallow water and they're forced to use three ounce jigs, even though they're only in 15 feet of water, because that's the only thing you can do to get at the whole bottom. When you're in these rocky areas, when your jig does start to roll or it starts to get pulled by the current, you get snagged pretty quickly. And, and that, you know, you spend a lot of time re-rigging all day anyway. But you sure don't want to uh, invite that problem by letting your bait roll across the bottom all day long. Right. And and I think that's an important thing. You don't want it rolling across the bottom. Right. And, uh, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of fishing is drift fishing or casting and retrieving. And uh, what's your thought about the movement of these baits uh, once they're hitting the, the, the bottom when you're fishing for tog? Again, very peculiar. Um, certain types of fishing, early season, like in Jersey, when you're early season in, say, October, you're, even though there's only one fish at a limit per day, if you go out there and the fish are very, very aggressive, you can use small baits and drop them to the bottom. There's a thing called quick fishing where you'll drop your two baits at the bottom and you'll real quick give them a give them a little a little tap, you know, just give them a little motion. And very quickly after that, you'll come over and you'll start getting hits and the fish are very attracted to the movement. It's really a hot thing if you're baited with sand fleas or with fiddler crabs. That was something I learned actually years ago. I probably learned that 30 years ago with Gary Fagan on the Big Mohawk. He referred to it as quick fishing fiddlers. And uh, it, it's very effective because early in the year, these fish are just foraging like crazy. You know, they're moving around a lot. Once they start to, once the water starts to get good and cold and we start moving off to the reef sites and we're having fun and now we're getting some, a little bit bigger fish, maybe we're getting some 10 pound fish here and there. It, it's a lot more fun. That's what I'm really looking forward to. But the days that we live and die for, uh, I kind of have an arrangement with the captains that I charter their boats on these certain days. They know that if we have a, a perfect a perfect weather day, I'll usually get a call from the captain the night before and says, hey, Frank, you want to do something special? Why don't you meet, be on the boat at four? Tell each guy it's another $50 and we'll end up, you know, searching. We'll go on a trophy hunt. Maybe we'll hit wrecks, you know, 20 to 30 miles out. Uh, it's kind of a chance of a lifetime type of thing. But boy, you want to talk about finding jumbos. Whoa. Yeah, well, and and you've been on. So why don't you share with with some of the people some of the uh, the fish that have come over the rails on not only on your line but with some of your uh, your buddies when you were out on these trips. Oh man, I the guys I fish with are incredible, and it probably started many years ago. I used to fish on party boats, and then my kids started playing hockey, and I started fishing on my own boat in the back, and I did that for a lot of years. When my kid graduated and he no longer plays hockey, I started fishing on charter boats again. 
and I'm lucky. So a couple of really good friends of mine started getting me fishing with the with Jerry Pastorino on the Fishmonger. Jerry's straight up legend. Usually my spot on the Fishmonger is Jerry fishes from his window and I fish behind the house right next to him. So I just basically sit there watching him all day. And there's days when it's completely and totally humbling. But at the end of the day, I can ask Jerry a question and he, he'll respect what I'm saying because I'm not asking something silly. It's not like a novice question. And he'll respect me enough to give me the real answer that I'm looking for. It's almost like like Blackfish University. It's like it's such a high level of a conversation. And it'll help me so much that over the years, these tidbits have have really raised my level to like a whole new place. I also fish with guys like um, Chris Voss, who runs Allison's Nightmare out of Cape May. Tom Daffin that runs Fish and Fever out of Cape May. Um, these are these are just straight up awesome guys that fish the way we like to fish. And it's so much fun and it's so easy to hang out with these guys. And you got to, you know, be ready to work. You're not going out. You're not the guy taking the nap, on, you know, after lunch when the bite's slow and you're in there, you, you ate a sandwich and you're taking a nap because that's the guy that really won't get invited back anymore because six lines in the water, we put six limits on the deck. We're looking for six trophies. Uh, that one guy that goes in there and takes a nap, that, that's why I have a very, very tight group of guys that I fish with on my list. Yeah. Now, to go back to the – we were talking, you know, jigs and stuff. The only time you really want to jig a jig is – when you're doing the, the quick fishing, right? Like they want to stay, you want to keep them on the bottom, right? It, it really depends on the time of the year. Early, when we go out there and it's like mid-November and Jersey just opened, or like it is up in Rhode Island right now, the water temps are so warm up there. They're only like three degrees behind us when, with water temp. So those fish are so active and sure that you could flip a three-quarter ounce jig with a crab 20 feet up ahead of a boat let it come down to the bottom and let it kind of wash over like a gravelly bottom and the fish will just pick it up and swim off with it because it's a very natural presentation. But you have to be extremely careful where you do that so you're not getting snagged all day. You know, right now when the fish are very active, a little bit of movement is okay. Um, when your surface temp is 38 degrees, to drop that crab to the bottom and, you know, lift it up and down a couple times, then big old blackfish, they're not usually that stupid. They would much rather find a, a big old crab that, you know, maybe got stepped on a couple times and it's just kind of sitting in the bottom and so it comes up and it smells it and it's ready to eat it. To me, I find that much more appetizing to a wise old fish rather than a, a dancing green crab. Right. So let, let's that actually brings a, a, a pretty good topic that we should talk about. So talking about the baits and how you're preparing them and, and how you're dropping them. But be, be, actually, let's start with that. And then I want to just jump right into what types of rigs are you using? What types of jigs and jig sizes are you using? Mm -hmm. um, and, and when we talk about the bait, are you using different baits for inshore versus offshore? Sure. Inshore, I'll use Asians, fiddlers, green crabs. Out at the reef sites early in this early in the season, we'll use green crabs a lot. We really don't get into the white leggers too too early, because if we're on a boat, if if the four of us were on the deck of a boat and we're all using green crabs, and the bite gets a little slow, and I start fishing white crabs, and if I start getting a bite going pretty good with the white crabs, it would not be unusual for me to have a real good bite going, and for you guys to crawl like almost to nothing. Those fish will get on those white crabs when that water's cold, and they don't want anything else. Right. Whereas if you don't use white crabs at all, if everybody's using green crabs, you'll all pick fish all day long. But as soon as you put those white crabs into the mix, it really changes the game. Ensure when they're when they're really active, green crabs are just fine. They're like the perfect size the perfect size blackfish bait too. Now, yeah. let me ask you, I've been on a couple uh, charter boats. Um, those guys are using conch. Do you have any experience with using those? It's excellent. Yeah. Conch's excellent. Very it drives me crazy. <laughs> we plant a lot early in the year. A lot of times what I'll do um, early in the year is I'll fish a jig like this and I'll tie I'll tie it on the like 40, 40 pound mono and I'll actually put a five odd owner hook on the mono and i'll just have the hook just slide right down on top of the jig and i'll put clam on the hook and i'll put a piece of crab on the jig and what will happen is 
the fish will come over and they'll get attracted to the clam on some days. And then when they find the crab and they're kind of already there eating, sometimes they'll eat that crab too. A lot of times in the springtime, we get them straight up on clam and they come over and, and pick it up and eat it just fine. They bang it just like they would a crab. Hmm. If they're yeah, very they're unactive there. in the spring, if the water's really cold, they get into them soft baits. Right, right. And and uh, are you're using fresh clam, not salted? Both, usually yeah. fresh. Okay. All right. And now for, for those who don't know, Ed, you want to tell them why using conch is such a uh, pain oh, in the neck? Yeah. Well, typically when the boats get them, they're in a shell and the only way to remove them or to use them as bait is to remove them from the shell. So they, there's guys like there are, there's a, you know, a cutting table on the back of the boat and they're pounding on them with hammers and try, <laughs> trying to get these things out. And that's all you hear all day long. But yeah, you got to make for it. Well, that is true. That's what, if you have a good mate on the boat, they'll take care of it. I, I will say this: the uh, I have noticed uh, uh, it's only a couple of times where the boat that I was on took out conch, and similar to as you said with the white leggers, it pretty well shut down everybody else. That's uh, awesome. every other bait stopped with hermit crabs. Hermit crab, hermit crabs as well. Hermit crabs are the bane of my existence. I actually hate them. Thing. Yeah. But when the fish get on the her the hermits. The hermits kind of look like a snail. They're like half snail, half crab. And when you put them on the hook, they're really soft. Sometimes if you drop that jig down with a hermit crab or two on it, you'll put it down and the jig will hit the bottom and you'll get tick. And, and that's the bite. Tick and it's yeah. gone. The bait's gone. Your bite's gone. You miss the fish and that's it. So either you adjust to that soft delicate bite and start setting the hook on that and start being ready to detect it there are days when you start fishing with with hermits like that as you're dropping your bait to the bottom you're really counting down you're watching the colors in your braid that you know when you're right near the bottom you want to have your rod face down so when you close the bail you can take up the slack immediately and you're ready to swing because when you get that tick it's all over you just get that one little shot and it's done yeah it's similar to sheep's head the, the mm -hmm. big sheep's head, uh, yeah. you know, not all, sometimes they just grab it and run. Um, yeah. actually I don't have an experience when they didn't, to be honest with you, but some, but sometimes they just, you know, the line moves, you don't even feel it. And all of a sudden your, your soft bait is gone. I've had days when I come home and I'm talking to myself, just literal <laughs> myself was just like, oh my God, what am I doing here? Yeah. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I think we've all had those days. Now there, there is one other soft bait that you haven't talked about yet. Uh, and I, I want to bring this up because earlier today in a conversation, Joe was talking about shrimp and how everything eats shrimp, mm -hmm. but they don't eat the, you don't use the shrimp that most people would nope. when you're going out. No nope. cooked, cooked, fro cooked, frozen shrimp with no shell, like shrimp cocktail shrimp. Yep. That that's what they like to eat. I don't know why, but they do. It's amazing to me. It, it is absolutely cocktail or tartar. Yeah. It's amazing. So, so you're using cooked shrimp and, and actually I did have, I wanted to bring that up because I do have a question. What size cooked shrimp are you using? Are you going for the jumbos or are you going medium. smaller? What's that? Medium. Medium. Okay. All right. Serious. Serious. Don't know. Not again. That's more of a springtime thing when you're using the clams and the shrimp, they kind of go together, but yeah, that's, that's for, that's for real. Okay. So, all right. So in the fall, you're looking at green crabs, Asian shore crabs, uh, fiddlers, if you can get them, if you're closer in shore, I don't know how well a fiddler would pass, you know, 10 miles offshore on a wreck. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the white leggers, what, what type of rigs and jigs are you using when you're, when you're fishing for these? If I, if I'm you, as far as a, a, as far as a jig goes, I think I showed you something like this. This is Dante's magic tail jig. This is an ounce and a half. But most good quality jigs are going to work. I'm going to rig this on like three foot of 40 pound mono. Sometimes I'll put a slider rig actually on top of it and let it just hang right down there. No need for an extra mono leader and a hook hanging back here. And it just it just becomes too much. The beauty of fishing a jig is in the simplicity of fishing with the jig. You take that jig, you put a half a green crab on. And when I put a half a green crab on these, I'm never fishing it with the legs on. I'm nice and clean and simple, and I'm usually hooking it in like the first leg hole. So the crab will actually hang back a little bit, a little bit elongated, where I don't want a half of a green crab sitting on there like a large chunk. 
because it's going to kind of look like a parachute behind the behind the jig. And the whole thing with this is I want it to be very streamlined. I want it to go to the bottom and lay nicely. And I want it to be easy for the black fish to eat. Right. So you're crushing the shells. Usually, um, if I really, if I first got there and I'm just looking to get them to eat, I'm fishing them with no shells. I'm going to give them a nice, easy meal. Okay. All right. No so leg, no shells, easy peasy. Okay. And you're, you're typically stepping on them a couple of times to smash no, them? Not too much yet. Once I start fishing with those, with the bigger green crabs and the white crabs, when okay. I start fishing on a rig and I'll, my favorite is if I can get a white crab about, I'd say about three inches around, something about like that. I'll normally take it and I'll trim the claws off and I'll trim all the way back, but I'll leave the flippers on. And then what I'll do is, again, a whole crab. I'll usually fish it with, with a sweetheart rig, something like this, okay? Very simple. It's an owner octopus five aught hook cutting point, and the other hook is just, just drop down the leader just like this. This leader is 60 pound. Um, 60 pound tsunami pro fluorocarbon. If you haven't used it, try it because it's better than Yozori. It's great stuff. And it's, you know, this is about eight inches long, easy peasy. And if you take that crab and if you take this one hook and put it in, in one claw hole and take the other hook in the other claw hole, the leg, the, the leader will lie nicely right back between these two, between these two hooks. I don't know if you can see it, yeah. but that's the crab lay very nice and straight on your leader. All this is to avoid it from twisting as it's dropping to the bottom. When you tie your rig on, you have a 10 ounce weight, you're in 80, 100 foot of water. You take that crab like that, and this is where you maybe you drop it on the deck, and maybe you step on it a couple times by accident. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and as it's dropping to the bottom, it's kind of like a mushy little pancake where I really don't want something that's going to be spinning. So I'm very peculiar how I want the bait on there. When it does get to the bottom, that's where I really want it to just rest there. A couple reasons why, again, in the fall, we, you go out there and bounce your bait. And I'll go out there and won't bounce my bait. You're going to catch a lot of dogfish. You're going to catch a lot of sea bass. Right. Not going to catch a lot of blackfish. The guy right. that bounces his bait, I don't even want to be on your side of the boat. I want to I want to be away from that guy who's bouncing. Bouncing, I mean, bouncing the bait is can be counteracted by fishing a slack line. Okay. And, and fishing a slack line is a very unique skill. It's not the kind of thing that you do with other types of fishing. But what it what it refers to is it refers to kind of being on the balls of your feet and being able to hold this rod in such a way that as the as the rod as the waves go up and down and the boat goes up and down you can kind of pivot a little bit and you can keep your sinker on the bottom and not lift it up and when you feel a tap 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 you can very quickly take a turn up get your rod down to about four percent about the four o'clock position when you do get a good solid thump, thump from a blackfish, usually on like the third one, I'm real quickly going to do something that a lot of guys don't do it this way, but I refer to this as the efficient hook set, okay? And it's very simple. All I'm going to do is push down on the butt of the rod, push down on the butt. It's right in front of my hip. I'm right on the reel. I get 10 or 12 cranks on that, on that fisher until the fish stops me, and I'm locked in. The fish is in the the butt is in my gut, my hands on the foregrip. It probably got the fish 10, 15 feet off the bottom before he knows what's happening. I can just hang on at this point, let that fish dig to the bottom. And then when I can, I can fight this fish towards the top. And these are some of the techniques that allow us to catch bigger fish. Right. Well, I, I think the most important part of that technique is getting those 10, 12 cranks in to get them up off the bottom. Yeah. You know what? That's good. A good point, Ed. But you know what the most important part is? Seven foot, ten inch rod. Okay, the rod is a fulcrum. It's nothing more. It is a tool. Okay, it, it's a lever. Your your four your hand on the foregrip is the fulcrum. That lever, when you push down on the butt, you're moving the tip. Now, when you push down on the butt, the butt is locked in. Okay, it's locked in. The tip is up. 
it's it's locked in. You get some cranks on, you're going to see that rod go, and it's just going to go, boom, 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 boom. but you're in such a powerful position that when I see guys fishing, oh, they get a, they get a hit. They got the rod under their arm. They lift the rod up. Oh, I got a hit. Okay, then what do they do? Now they got the rod up in the air. They're, they have to, this is a loaded question. They have yeah. to bring the rod down to put it under their arm. So they bring the rod down, they put it under their arm, the fish swims into the bottom, and it goes, whoop, whoop, whoop. oh, got me again. Yeah, and for those that aren't aware, the, the important thing for blackfish, and it's really the bigger blackfish, if you're catching 15, 17, 18 inches in, inshore, they're not going to do this to you very often. It's pretty rare. But they will dig for the bottom, they will get into those boulders or into the wreck, and they have their fins are amazing. They will go in, they will extend their fin, their head first into the structure. They extend their dorsal fins and their other fins, and you cannot get them out. They lock themselves in there. And you can wait, and sometimes they do come out. Sometimes they'll release it, and you'll get to kind of work them back out of the structure. But most often, the guy next to you is just laughing at you because you're spending 10 minutes trying to get this, what should be a beautiful fish out, that you're never going to get out. So you're just wasting your time if you, waiting. If you watch these guys on these boats... It's the same guys that do the same thing all the time. Yeah. Because, and it's, it's a simple matter of, it's a bad habit. It's, it's just a bad habit. It's just bad technique. A lot of people like, oh yeah, my biggest black fish, six pounds, seven pounds. That's great. God bless. Enjoy it. I'm looking for the bigger ones. I'm looking for, you know, 15. I'm looking for 20. Oh, let's just keep going. Let's let's really push this envelope as far as we can. If you use the proper techniques, you got to use it on every fish. Use it on every time the fish bites. You don't know if that's a 16-inch fish or a 16-pound fish by the way it's biting. You do not. When you swing that rod, you know. If you swing it like a little fish and it's a big fish, You'll never know how big that fish is because he just got you. Right, right. Yeah, and dropping that rod tip is the worst thing you can do. A lot of people, um, it, it it is kind of funny. You see some that, that know that they shouldn't ever drop the rod, but they end up reeling above their head. Mm -hmm. And they keep reeling above their head, which is really funny because if it's a big fish, it's really hard to keep the leverage on a big fish with the rod above your head. I can't you have do it. No, you have no leverage because no. your fulcrum is above your head and the bottom of the lever is not locked in. So right. that big fish is just going to go and you're yeah. going to go with it and it's, it's over. Yeah. Then they're down in those rocks and, uh, and you're done. So, so the, let's talk about the fight on one of these big fish real quick. So you got one of the large, let's, so what, what's your what's your largest or the range of your largest almost 16 for me okay so let's say a 16 pound blackfish you pull that up what does the fight look like like what would somebody expect if they're going to hook into a 15 plus pound tog when, when you get the bite it's not unusual this time of year to throw that bait out there nice big crab you stood on it you stepped on it a couple times that crab might be sitting there for 15 20 minutes after about 20 minutes with no action i'll pull it in i'll replace the crab i'll put it out again but it's not unusual to put it out there and you'll be sitting there for 10 minutes or so and all of a sudden you'll get a bite and the big fish will always bite usually around the same time during the day there's a thing that i refer to as the big fish window where you get a time during the day, it might be early in the morning, it might be late in the afternoon when the sun is getting ready to go down. On cloudy days, it tends to happen sometimes during the day too, but there will usually be a period of time of like a half an hour where if two or three double digit fish get caught on the boat that day, they all come within this period of, of time. Usually because the current or the conditions, something made, something made these big fish decide to come out and eat at this certain time. What will happen is this crabs that's been sitting here, you you won't. Sometimes you'll just get a little. A, a, with a smaller fish, you'll get some days you'll get what's called a scratch bite, where you'll just get a little a little tap, 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 and then it'll kind of stop for a minute. When the blackfish hit a little more pronounced, it's not like a little scratch bite. It's more like a a tug, 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 and that's where he's got it in his mouth and he's committed to it. Um, the bigger fish, because you're using such a big bait, I would usually wait till I can't wait anymore. Usually like the third or fourth good solid tug. And sometimes when those big fish hit, sometimes they do feel big. And they'll actually feel just, it'll be just like a womp, 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 
why don't it's almost like it's ripping your ripping the rod out of your hands when you're ready when you start to feel that you take a crank or two up on the reel you get that rod down to about four percent man and when you swing it's like whoop, rod tip up rod butt in your gut crank that handle and you'll just see the tip of the rod just whoop, 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 and it'll just roll over and it'll just start doing the work when you get those cranks on that fish that fish will be sitting there and he'll just start digging for the bottom what you're feeling when you see someone catching a blackfish and you see the rod tip going like this what's happening is the fish is actually head down towards the bottom and you're actually seeing the vibrations from the pulsation of his tail right so he's trying to get down you're trying to hold him there and basically you're at a standoff at this moment depending on the size of the fish this might last for 10 15 seconds it might last for might last for 30 or 40 seconds and all of a sudden something will happen the boat will go up on a swell the boat will start to come down the fish will make a turn you'll get a couple more turns on them and at this point when you're at this point when you have this fish safely say 10 15 feet 20 feet off the bottom you can then lower the rod into a horizontal position just into a very powerful position if you want to move the rod under your arm now you can but still locked into your gut is a great idea and you're now fighting the fish from the center portion of the rod and the butt portion of the rod you're just using all the power that's in reserve in that tool that you have and you're again you're using the boat as the boat goes up your the rod will go down as the boat goes down you can get a couple cranks on them never pump the rod because that's my next question yeah don't pump the rod you have a 10 ounce weight eight inches away from the fish's face okay you start pumping the rod the sinker's going up down up down which means it's changing the angle of the pull of the hook you want to see somebody lose fish the guy that pumps the rod is probably the same guy that bounces which gotcha. is how it goes. but as you slowly work that fish towards the top uh you the mate will be will be nearby I know the Nate mate. He knows me. I'll move my rod away from him as I see this fish getting closer to the surface. As I see the fish is about maybe three or four feet down, I'll very slowly and methodically move the rod tip in front of him. So I'm now swimming the fish towards the mate. He puts the net in the water, nets the fish. I see the nets in the, the fish is in the net. I put the rod tip up. I release the roll in the, the reel in the free spool. And, you know, just enjoy that moment. Wow. I much different experience with my biggest. It was, <laughs> it was crazy. It was mayhem when I caught mine. I, I was mm -hmm. under geared. I was, uh, it was only a nine pounder, but it was, I was under geared. Uh, I was using my flounder gear. Um, didn't even really expect to go fishing, but yeah. And the thing that really got to me was they, they sometimes have a second dig to, to the bottom. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, you get them 20, 30 feet up. So I had caught on that day a nine pounder and, uh, it was, it was an amazing fight. It was on lighter. It was like on flounder gear. So it was tough, but I got it in. I hooked a bigger one later and I actually had it up and it was way up. It was probably 60 feet of water. I had him about 20 feet, uh, under the water. So he's, he's up about 40 feet off the bottom and it dug. And it just started going and there was no stopping. And I, I not only had the reel locked at, what was it, 22 pounds of max drag, which should have been enough, but I was also trying to thumb it and I couldn't stop it. It started burning my thumb. Now, to give you a perspective, the same reel I had to thumb this summer when I caught a, what, four and a half foot uh, brown shark mm. on it. And I was able to thumb it there and I didn't cry after Mm -hmm. I was, it, my thumb was really burned on this tog. I mean, the, the power behind those tails yeah. is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, Richard, and it's all about a system. You know, the, the system I fished, the Century Pro Togger, a, Di a Daiwa Saltiga 15, not a 15H, not high speed, the low speed Daiwa Saltiga 15, 50 pound Daiwa J braid. I like the multicolor, so I know when it's getting close to the bottom. And then I tie it to... A, 60, a piece of 60 pound Andy Pink top shot where I'll have a piece, usually about 25 feet long. I'll tie a top shot on there with, an, with a uh, Yucatan knot. The bottom of that top shot, I'll double up about the bottom two or three feet. And then I'll put my sinker and I'll tie my rig directly into that. 
The reason I do that with the 60 pound Andy top shot is because braided line has really no, no stretch. The pro togger is not a soft, a soft wimpy rod. It does not have a lot of stretch absorbing properties in it. That, that long top shot is like a rubber band. So when that fish does start to dig, if you have the right, the right rod and the right braid and the right top shot and the right knots and everything holds together. You're just a double digit catching machine, man. But if you bring your flounder rod and you let Ed tie your knots for you, what do you got? I, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm a good knot tire. Thank you. Okay. It's not what I heard. <laughs> not for me, Ed, not for Sorry. me. I, I will tell you that, uh, I was good with the knots at least. None of the knots gave way. I was using 30 pound braid. What and broke? uh what was that? What broke? Uh nothing broke, actually. Um, I actually and, and I was using 20 pound mono, which mono leader, which everyone was making fun of me for, but I was also able to hold the bottom with 30 pound braid and 20 pound mono True. with only uh three ounces, where mm -hmm. everybody else was using, you know, eights. You know, I mean, the, the tog, for those that aren't aware, if you're using a rig, like that sweetheart rig that Frank showed, I mean, you had, what did you have, an eight ounce that you held up before? Ten. Ten. Ten ounces of lead on that thing. I I just, uh, I find that difficult. <laughs> we are, uh, we are getting some questions in here if you want to start touching on that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think, I think we should jump into a few of these questions here. All right. So participation trophy, uh, are rigs better for ocean wreck fishing 60 plus feet? I really prefer to fish rigs, especially if we're, if we're on a trophy hunt, if, if we're on a trophy hunt, it's me and five of my very close friends and we're on a mission. And when we're going to go out, when we're going to make that run 30 miles out and we're hunting for trophies, if five of us are fishing rigs and one of us is fishing a jig, that guy fishing a jig is really going to mess us up because he's not going to scope down the same way as we are. And if he does hook a big fish and he does break off, it's going to ruin the spot. And if we run two hours to that spot and you break off with a rig, okay, it happens. And if you're fishing a jig and you have 20 pound leader on here, and you break this thing off and break off that big fish and it shuts the bite down on that, on that wreck. We might not have another wreck to go to within 10 miles. So what do we do for the next hour? I'm not going to be real thrilled with you and you won't be invited back on my charter. <laughs> but keep in mind, these jigs um, are, are magical. And there's times when I'm fishing this jig with a small hole crab, especially when I'm inshore and, and, I'm, and I'm landing double digit fish, fish just fine. And there's a few guys I know that are so, so scary good with the jig. They're in a whole new level. They're in a whole new level. I'd like to be at that level. I, I will say this, Frank. There so were what, no trophies on that trip when I was when I was using the twenty pound. <laughs> there were no tro. That was not a trophy hunting trip. How big was that fish you got? The second. I don't e I don't even recall. I mean, it was it was just it was at nine pounds or I think it was just under nine pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was I shouldn't say it was flounder gear. It was a flounder reel, and but it was a, an old Shimano Corrado rod. Mm -hmm. that i was actually i brought it out there to break it that day to see if we could break it and it didn't it it, it worked the, the rod was actually probably a little too stiff rich sometimes those those big fish you know sometimes you'll get a really really feisty 12 pounder man that you're swearing you got a new pb you're thinking you're so you know you think you got a really big fish and he comes up and he's 12 and you're like hmm Man, I think fought a lot better than that. But you know what? If you, my point is, if you don't have the right gear and if you don't apply the proper techniques, nothing else matters. I mean, I'd rather be lucky than good on any given day. But I'm a, I'm a ver highly detail oriented individual. My knots, my lines, everything is perfect. When I go home the night before and I'm fishing again the next day, I bring my rods in, I put new top shots on, I put my rods back out of my car. When I walk on the boat that day, I have new top shots on there. I go on the boat. I look at the bait. I see what we got. If we have white leggers and they're all really big white leggers, I'm not going to fish a sweetheart rig that day because the crabs are really large. I'm going to fish a slider rig 
which is just like a sweetheart rig, except this hook, instead of being, instead of this hook being this way, the hook just lies down regular and they stack up just like that one next to the other. And then you can put a half a crab on each hook, let them go out there and let them soak just fine. So there are applications for both, but so I do switch off between the slider rig and the sweetheart rig, depending on what the bait is that day on the boat. But you kind of got to have a mindset and be ready to go out there and catch some big fish and, and let them go if you can. It's really right. nice if you're patient reeling them up. If they don't blow up, it's really nice to be able to let these big fish go. In Jersey, it's very challenging. Up in Rhode Island, catching these big fish up in 15 foot of water. When you pull that fish out of 15 foot of water, he barely knows he's hooked. He fought pretty good, but he's all ready to go. He's not blown up. He didn't blow his guts out or his butthole out. He's all ready to go. You bring yeah. him to the boat, take a couple pictures and let him go. And it's a tremendous release fishery up there. But it's almost like it's almost like you're fishing in an aquarium. It's a, it's a little crazy. I, I could deal with that. I will say, Frank, in my defense, after that trip, I went out and I bought a very nice tog rod uh and an appropriate reel so now running you know an appropriate reel for me i'm not out with the ex super expensive stuff but you know i put 200 into a reel i put a couple hundred into the rod and i now i now love uh i love that rod absolutely Wait, that, love that is rod. that the one that fell apart no the, the reel no oh <laughs> okay so it was a pen squall reel <laughs> And why I got it, I got it spooled because I didn't, I didn't want to spool it myself. So I had it spooled at, at a local shop and, uh, I didn't check anything, but the, the, and I don't think the, I don't think the guys at the shop did it, but the little plate on the side, the locking thing was unlocked. So one turn of the reel on the first drop and the side of the reel just popped off and right over the rail. So I'm right-handed oh, no. reeling left popped right over the rail and the guy next to me leans oh. over and we're watching it just kind of float oh. down. He goes, well, that really sucks. <laughs> I said, dude, I, I'm like, I got to use my spare rod now. I was back to the flounder, the flounder reel. Uh, those, the those text messages were gold, though. Oh. That, was, that was priceless. Re well, Penn said, you know what? This happens way more than we'd like to admit. Um, it is a known issue. And it's not that you did anything wrong or we did anything wrong. It's just you didn't check to see that it was locked you can that can get unlocked if it gets hit in the car and we're in the truck all it takes is something to hit that little that little switch and yeah. that's apparently what happened i've not had an issue with it since i actually love that reel now rich one day i was i was fishing on tom daffin's boat we were on fishing fever and it was a makeup trip where i showed up at the boat and here i was lucky because Nino Aversa and Ronnie were there. So I had a couple friends on the boat that day. We didn't even know it, but it was a lot of fun that day. And I remember we were we were driving out and it was it was 15 degrees on the ride out that morning. It was ex exceptionally cold. My rod was in the rod holder. Okay. I had two rods. My one rod, it was an IM8 graphite musky rod, and it had a a um what was it? It was an Abu Garcia 7000 a 7000 n it was a high speed narrow reel so it was yeah. a nice blackfish reel right so i thought <laughs> man i go out there i caught i caught a double digit fish i caught like a 10 i caught another 12 i hooked in the one i set the hook i got a couple cranks on them the fish started dogging the fish is dogging the rod blew up like at the stripper guide i'm like whoa okay lost that fish grab my other rod put this reel back on it the it was so cold that the temperatures affected the grease on the release dogs of the reel yeah. and and the release dogs would not both engage in the reel so i would drop my bait to the bottom lock it up get a bite and i'd go Bzz! because yeah. the dogs wouldn't i ended up using i ended up using tom's personal rod that day and i fished the rest of the day and i and i went home and like these things, I don't usually play with gear. I do. I just do not mess around with it. I, like I said, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I was driving home that day. I called my friend Joe Zagorski. I said, Joe, what kind of rods are you using? What kind of reel are you using? Joe tells me I'm using the Saltiga 15. I'm using the, uh, this kind of rod and blah, 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 blah. I wrote this all. Now, I'm driving, I'm driving up the parkway. It's like 6 o'clock at night. And I'm exhausted. I'm on the phone with the Dio rep ordering a couple new reels. 
I'm on the phone with a guy I know that builds rods. He's building me a couple of blackfish rods. The next week I went down there, I had two new rods and reels to go with. And this is a thing too, when you're on a boat like that, when you drop your bait to the bottom and you get stuck in the bottom, you don't play with it a real long time because it's killing your fishing time. So at that point in time, the mate will see I'm stuck. The mate will come over. I'll give them that rod. I'll grab my other rod that's completely rigged. That's just like rod number one. And I'm back in the game again because I don't want to waste all my, you know, that might be the magic window when the fish are going to eat. And here I am sitting here messing with my, messing with my uh, rod and stuff. Right. But this is why you get so close with these certain boats you get so close with these mates and if you have a good relationship with them and you tip them well and you take care of them, uh, it can take you places that you might not ordinarily go. Right. And I was going to say the boats that you fish on, you know, that, you know, you get on the fishmonger, you get on Allison's nightmare. You're, you're going to, you know, that you can trust that mate to get it off and get it. Are you letting them retie it? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Sean, Sean reties me. Okay. And Sean, Sean or Frank, they they know where my hooks are. They know what I'm, you know, Frank, what do you want a sweetheart? You want a slider? They go in there to get my hook. They, they tie me up. Yeah, because they rigged. I learned how to rig from them. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, Jerry showed me how to do it. That's the way I do it. Um, stand, like I said, standing there next to Jerry Pastorino, watching Jerry fish for fluke, blackfish, you name it. He is just such an amazing, amazingly skilled fisherman. Um it's it's just almost it, it's humbling to fish next to him but this is how you become a better fisherman if you're the best fisherman out of your group and you go out and you smoke everybody every day i hope you're not just like making fun of your friends every day i hope you're helping them become better but who's helping you become better right you know who are you rubbing elbows with that's going to teach you the knot how come your top knot keeps popping I don't know. Well, who are you talking to? Who can you, who can mentor you to help get your game up to speed? And that's where my friend Joe Zagorski comes into play. Joe has spent so much time speaking to me about every little tiny detail. And he's such a, again, phenomenal fisherman, very, very well schooled. He's a gentleman and a very, very good friend. And you just can't help but want to surround yourself with class people like that who really take you to the next level. Yeah, I think it's an important thing. And it's that the, I think a problem that a lot of people have is, you know, you look at people in fishing quite often now, and some of the people like to say they're the best and they're extremely standoffish in some cases. And, you know, you can't ask them to come on a live stream and talk about fishing because they don't want to share anything. Right. Uh, but those are not, those are not the people that that you hang out with uh you've talked in the past in several settings about how look for the people that are better than you and and be humble um sure. and i would consider you to be you know one of the best black fishermen i know i, I don't know jerry um pastorino i've tried to get on his boat and it's impossible because apparently you book it out continuously with your buddies um <laughs> i tried to what was it was it i think it was Al. no it's fishing fever i tried to get on couldn't get on that um yeah so i'm still i'm still hoping to, to get on one of those sometime well you have you know I'm, I'm a lucky guy i have friends that that charter these boats and certain boats like allison's nightmare my friend mark and i we have a thing going where like in november and december mark charters it every saturday and i charter it every sunday i'm on all of mark's trips and mark and sully are on all of my trips so right off the bat, we have three guys and then we mix in three of our other friends and, and that's how we go about doing it. That's how we can we can kind of control the narrative a little bit. And we're just looking to have fun and get our best chance at catching big fish. It's not about locking anybody out or anything like that. Right. It's just all about tr trying to trying to accomplish a, a personal best for each other and just trying to help each other along the way. And you've experienced some personal bests out there and your own and the others around you. Mm -hmm. You you were you were a step away from uh record books last year. Oh man, Sully Sully earned that fish. It was it was just so awesome to see him catch it. We were on uh we were on fishing fever and we were on a bit of a trophy hunt this one particular day and the conditions were not good. We got onto this one wreck and, and it really 
the conditions weren't right. We kept coming back on the anchors and the, the wind wasn't strong enough to hold us that the current kept pushing us back off the wreck. We would come tight again. The current would push us back again. We actually left, ran about another 15 miles, fished a different area. And then a little bit later on, the conditions changed. The wind picked up. The captain said, I'm, we're going to go back to this spot again. And he gets us on this spot. And we're all we're all catching fish. And we're all catching like, you know, eight, nine, ten pound fish. We all caught a couple of them that day. And it just so happened, Sully was telling me on the way out this day, Chris Sullivan, good friend of mine, my friend Mark Jadstan's buddy. And Sully... Um, Sully tells me, yeah, Frank, you know, I went to go buy your rod. I was looking for a Frank Mahalik's Pro Togger, and the shop didn't know what I was talking about, and they had this black hole, and they said, here, try this. This is what I use, and and I'm like, well, how do you like it? He goes, I don't really like it. He said, the, the butt's really long, and the reel's real far away from me, and it's really, really stiff. I'm like, well, if you want to use it, whenever I go on a boat, I bring three, pro, three rig Pro Toggers with me. Two are mine, and one is for anybody else to use. Well, it just so happened somebody was using number three. So I saw Sully over there in the corner, and he kind of looked at me. I said, Sully, if you want to use it, I said, I'm switching my rod. I said, I've been using a slider rig all day. I'm going to use a sweetheart rig. If you want to use this here, this is the rod I've been using all day. Yeah. I put it in Sully's hands. He starts putting white crabs down. He caught one small one. He caught another small, like decent fish. And he's like, oh, Frank, I like this rod. Next thing I know, I, I'm in, and I'm in the port up next to the house and Sully's in the starboard back corner. And I see Sully swing on a fish. He gets cranks on it and he's just holding it, the perfect form locked in his gut. And he's just sitting there and the fish is just, it's just digging and digging and digging. And it, it see like we were talking about how long the fish will dig. I swear that fish dug for 60 seconds. Wow. 60 seconds. He got some more cranks on him and started to get it up and he fought it perfectly. Just a beautiful job. Had the rod horizontal, horizontal fought the fish with the middle and the butt section of the rod. The rod did not have a bottom. The rod absolutely has more in it easily. And Sully fought the fish beautiful, and Captain Tom, Captain Tom netted the fish. And the whole time he was fighting the fish, I was in the other corner, so I pulled my cell phone out, and I just started firing off these pictures. I got awesome pictures of Sully catching the fish, the fish being netted. I have pictures of Captain Tom putting it on the scale and then looking at Sully like, you know what I just saw? <laughs> and again, I, I took all these pictures on the way in, I texted Joe Zagorski and told him we got something special. We're going to the scales. That day, him and his friends were out on Allison's Nightmare. So we all met at the gas dock in Hutch's Marina. And, uh, you know, uh, Captain Tom called the owner of the marina. So he was there with the certified scale. And we put it on the hook. And it pulled it down to a new New, new Jersey state record. And how much was that? 25.8 it's That's insanity. a monster <laughs> i could imagine and you know what it couldn't happen to a to a better guy because sully fishes hard he does things the right way he is a true gentleman and and he absolutely deserves it and and stories like that is that's why I do what I do. That's why I'm into this because you get those those type of memories especially with your friends your close friends I think that's, yeah, and that's a good, I want to show this comment because I think it's a, it's a good one um, from Red Clock Ranch. When does fishing turn from fun into work? It's great to be good, but at what cost? Yeah, good point. I'm a regular guy. I, I work 40 hours a week. I work really hard at my job. I work every third weekend and I do really well. I'm very fortunate. I have a job that I like a lot. I'm also really fortunate to have a boss that I could call, you know, I could go into work tomorrow morning and say, hey, boss, the bass are biting. You mind if I leave it at one today? And he'd be like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I'm really lucky to have that. I've also been very careful to never, never want to make a living out of fishing. As much as I want to work with companies like Century and with Tsunami, and I want to help them make better quality products at better prices so that we can all have a better time. I don't want to kid myself into thinking that I'm going to I'm going to support my family 
by doing this because it puts so much pressure on it that it's not fun. And all of a sudden you're looking at your checkbook and you're dividing how many hours you fish by how much money you have in the bank. And it's, I, I couldn't handle that. I would not enjoy that pressure at all. So uh, a lot of guys, they don't work. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I need money. Yeah. Feed the dog or he gets mad at me. But I think a, a big part of it is also perspective, right? So you've, I've heard you talk about days where you went out and you had one, one swing on a fish. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a big fish though, mm -hmm. right? You got the big fish and you didn't land it, but that was still a good day. Sometimes it, 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 when you're fishing for trophy blackfish, you're just hoping to get the right bite, right? You get the right bite. And if things hold together for you, it's awesome. It just so happened when I caught my personal best blackfish, we were on a trip that day, and Dennis Mullenforth, a good friend of mine, was standing right next to me. And Dennis is, I mean, you talk about legend. Dennis Mullenforth is straight up legend. And uh, he was cheering me on happier than anybody that I caught that fish. And, you know, even though I caught a fish bigger than him that day, that has nothing to do with it. It's just so cool that we can meet people who are a little bit as crazy as we are and as passionate as we are and you kind of can't help but feeling sorry for each other and loving each other at the same time right uh, i've i've met quite a few i'm one of them uh i will i will say that for me you know when is fishing become work and you know when you're doing content and and all of that it it is work um but i have different standards by it right so for me when i go out fishing my number one thing is not to get the trophy. There are certain days where it is, where it's, I need to get, you know, I'm going out and I'm going to this area and I need to catch a striped bass. It needs to exceed this length to be successful. But I have other goals that, that I'm, I'm really happy with. First is I want to, I want to fool a fish into, into biting this, this plastic piece of whatever that I threw in the water. I want to fool it into thinking it's real and there's a success, right? So I kind of build successes into my day so if i just have the striped bass bite it if it's striped bass and i'm going for it, i feel good uh if i'm able to see it actually that's that's really the big thing for me with a big fish i just want to see it if i can see it i don't always have to land it i've lost some really big fish i've lost big flounder um quite often i do a lot of flounder fishing and uh when i see them i'm actually pretty happy about it and i i, I don't get really upset because the chances are I probably wasn't harvesting it anyway, but uh, I think that also helps, you know, setting the realistic expectations and understanding that it's not always about filling the box at the end of the day. Sure. You know, there, there are other things that, that are just as much fun. You know, for me, the, getting the bite is the most exciting part. Um, well, you know, Rich, you're right. And, and it's not about, for me, I don't, I don't just talk to talk. I walk to walk. I, I want to be a big fish guy. I fish like I'm fishing for big fish. I don't always catch them. But at the same time, I'm not going to go out there and beat my chest and and defame other people who are out there trying just as hard as I are. As mm -hmm. I, am. And maybe they need a little bit of encouragement and maybe they need a little bit of help getting their stuff together. And I mean, I see guys, uh, oh my God, every time they catch a 10 pound blackfish, they're putting pictures up, they're blowing it up. Here's a video. It's a line class record. It's this, it's, a, and it's not any of those things. It's not a line class record. You just made a fool of yourself by shouting this out in front of all your friends who you want to respect you, but you sound like you're the only person in the world that matters. And to me, uh, I got a beautiful wife. I got some great kids. I got a beautiful dog. I'm a very lucky man. I love to catch fish. Good for me, but that's it. Right. <laughs> Do my best. That's all I got. I yeah. agree. hundred percent. All right. We've got a few more questions. I want to definitely get in here before, before we, and I feel fishy on the double hook bait rig. Do you tie your lead direct or use a fish finder rig to feel the bait better i don't use a fish finder rig at the bottom at the bottom of the top shot i do this thing called a belmar rig and what that means is you the, your 20 foot length of top shot you take about the bottom the bottom two or three feet and you'll take it and you'll tie i use a two turn um what do i use you can use a double surgeon's loop or i i use a um what's it called Oh, I forget. But a double surgeon's loop will work. And that yeah. 
fine, I'll take it and I'll actually hang this, I'll actually hang the sinker from it. As a matter of fact, let me show you. I kind of knew this was going to come up. And this is something, this is actually called the bell marry. And it doesn't matter what people tell you or what they say, but this is what the Belmar rig is, confirmed by friends of mine who've been doing this a long time. This is the double line. You can see that knot right there. Okay. Yeah. And this is the bottom of the this is the bottom of the double line. You can see that loop. I'm trying to trying to yeah. get it. Yeah, okay. we can see it. Okay. So I'll take that double line and I'll put my sinker on it. And when I do it, I'm really careful to go right up to the knot to hold it because I want both of these legs on this sinker to be really even, okay? I don't want to make it open. I want it even. Then I'll come up about four fingers, the way legend has it, and I'm going to double this line just like that, make a little loop. I'm going to take my my rig. really hard to get a good picture of this, but I'm going to take the, the rig that has a perfection loop in the end of it and I'm going to put the double lines inside of the perfection loop rig right there. And then I'm going to take the hooks and put them through the double line loops. And it sounds like a lot, but when it comes up, you interlock the loops just like that. Now you're almost done. Okay, you got a really nice connection there, really strong. But then you take your sinker and your double line and you tie one loop over it. Tie another loop over it. You can tell it's not black this season because this has taken me a long time. <laughs> well, you usually don't have to explain it and, and you're not moving. Right. Tie another loop over it. Pull them tight. Lock them down. Grab your rig. Pull it out. It'll lock in real nice. And what will happen here is... What will happen here is your rig is standing straight out from your double line. So right. you have your sinker and your double line and your rig sticking out. This is this does not foul very often. So when you bait it up and you throw it to the bottom, it very seldom fouls up. But it is a bulletproof, bulletproof, strong terminal connection. Hope I described that. The Belmar rig. That's yeah. that's perfect. Um, Tone Lee's got one uh, with two hooks in the crab. Uh, does the blackfish inhale both hooks or just one? A lot of times they'll come up and they're, they'll chomp on that crab. And again, I'm I'm not just going to hit it like right away. I'm going to let them really eat it. So I'll wait for like boom, 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 boom. By the time the fourth one happens, I usually end up getting them with just one hook, believe it or not. By the fourth yeah. hit, you can't resist setting that hook. I can't help it anymore. <laughs> I don't think I could, I could wait that long. <laughs> it almost feels like the fish is going to rip the rod out of your hands at that point. Yeah, you you wait until the adrenaline overtakes all sense and reason, and you're just going to slam that hook. Yeah, because you, I don't want to, I don't want to move it too quickly. Again, the water's so cold, the fish get very, very docile, very dormant. They're not very aggressive. Right. If you, if you swing that crab, you missed. He's not going to come back. If that fish is to hitting that crab and you swing and you don't get him, that you're going to let that bait hit the bottom. That fish is probably not coming back for it. Right. You have to just reel up, put a new crab on, throw it out to the same spot, and hope he comes over and eats it again. Because blackfish are just not that stupid. No, and well, especially at blackfish at, at the double digit sizes are they're old fish. They're not four or five year old fish. Mm -hmm. You know, they're 10, 15 year old. Yeah. Plus, and they didn't yeah. get that big by being silly. Black, right. you're right. Blackfish in Jersey and, and down south, Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, those fish grow at a rate of about one inch per year. When they get up around Rhode Island, it's more like three quarters of an inch a year because of the because of the colder water temperatures, those fish go dormant and they stop feeding for a for a long period in the winter, and that affects their growth rate annually. Where in Jersey, those fish that are on a wreck 20, 25 miles offshore, that water temperature really doesn't change much, change much. Those fish feed all year round. Right. They grow all year round. The fish down south tend to grow a little, a little bit sooner, but not not a whole lot. Well, and I think the last time we talked, the wasn't aren't they almost like a different DNA sequence on those fish from like Maine to, I forget what it was, Maine to to New York and then yeah, New York and yeah. South. I think they are. 
Yeah, from from New York South, there, there's a there's a little bit of a different genetic makeup. I've heard. Right. Don't know a whole lot about that, but I did hear that. Right. Uh, there was another one in here. Let me find this. You've kind of answered it, but if you would just kind of uh, for Laura, if you if if you would just reiterate the the rod and reel that you like. Um, actually, I guess when specifically mm -hmm. for jigging. That's a great question. I really like the new. Um, at Century, we changed a few rods around, and we have one. It's called a Weapon Mag Taper. It's seven foot ten inches long, spinning reel, and I like a Daiwa BGMQ four thousand size with twenty pound uh, twenty pound Daiwa J eight braid on it. Oh, you're a Daiwa J eight. Yeah, it's and so then, smooth. it's so it's so smooth. It just got yeah. me. Uh, I feel fish. You put up a good one too. Um, in the deeper water, is there a proper way, proper way to release a tog? Um, and yes, I can answer. They do blow up like sea bass. They absolutely do. The best thing that we do is when we do hook a fish, we try to be, you fight them the way you fight them, you know, but you don't fight them crazy fast. You don't like try to reel them up like super fast or crazy. We, you take your time because these fish are so big. If you fight them really quickly, you're going to lose them. When we do get a fish up that does, they usually do have a little bit of issues. Maybe their eyeballs are popping out a little bit. Maybe they got a little bit of the bends. We usually put them in a tote of salt water on the deck and we let them kind of hang out in there for a little bit let them sit horizontal and flat and let them sit there for five, 10 minutes. A lot of times everything will start to come back to normal and then they'll get to a point where they're almost ready to go. One time on Fishmonger, um, Jerry had a, one of those rugged trash cans. It was like a gray trash can from Home Depot. It was like 24, it was maybe 30 inches tall. And he had it like three quarters of the way full with water. And he put a big fish in there head down so the fish was head down in the bottom of the trash can and it was just sitting there after about five or ten minutes or so man this tail just started going this is like water's going all over the place Jerry's like, oh, I'm ready to go we took him out put him in the net put him in the water and and he was all he recovered real nicely and they were all ready to go oh that's interesting yeah it's yeah. always it's always tough because a lot of people catch these trophy fish and they don't want to keep them but if they're blown out it's almost like well should I just keep it anyway? Because it's probably not going to make it. So it's good to see that you guys are coming up with different ways to try it out and, and see yeah. what works. It's almost, you know, it, it's nice to think that you'll let them go, but if you're going to let them go and they're going to die anyway, it's almost like a sin to waste it. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I, I saw a, uh, an article, I think it was in North Carolina. I, I could be mixing them up. I think it was the North Carolina record speckled trout. And the guy tried so hard to release the thing and it just i think he spent like an hour which to me is excessive like yeah that that's a lot and uh it broke his heart but it ended up being a record fish anyway and he knew it was a record when he when he did it but he kept it he harvested it and he ate it and good for him uh yep. tip of the cap for him for doing what he thought he should do i'm not saying you have to but, you know, he, he tried to do it, didn't work, and then said, you know what, I'm not just going to let it float out there. I'm gonna, I'm just going to take it home and, and have some dinner out of it. So that's great. We let so many of our double-digit fish go. Anything that we get that, that's really frisky, um, we don't even get too excited about anything that's, you know, until, we, until it gets to like eight, nine pounds, we don't even really look at it. We're just looking to let them go. We'll yeah. keep the fish. You know, if we want to keep fish for the dinner table, we'll keep the nice eating, you know, 17, 18 inch fish. But anything over like five, six pounds, as a gentleman's as a gentleman's agreement on our boat, we're letting all those fish go that will survive. At least we do the best we can to, to let them go. That's great. That's great. Yep. All right. I think I think we've gone through I, I do want to bring this one up here because I love this from Andrew Wolf. No way. I can't believe we're talking Tog on Salt Strong. Yes, we are. <laughs> so I guess Andrew was a little late to it. We're going to be talking a lot of the Mid-Atlantic Northeast species going forward. And we're going to be talking about them uh, at 8 o'clock on Monday nights in this live stream. So uh, come back. We will be, we will be talking with, uh, with, with a lot of people. Maybe we'll get Frank back on again to talk a little bit when he gets the New Jersey state record this year and knocks his buddy off of the the top of the 
the heat. I don't, I don't know, man. Sully got him a dandy. Yeah, I, that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough one. I mean, you're talking twenty. I mean, twenty five hey, plus. If there's one that big, there's always one bigger. That's true. And you got to be fishing the right spots. So too. cool to be there. I was, I was, I'm just so happy for him because he's such a gentleman and he works so hard at it. Nobody deserves it more than him. Yeah. I, well, it, I'm going to show one more comment if I can find it real quick because I don't think I'll ever meet Sully. Uh, I, I can't find it real quick. It says, it sounds like Frank's not inviting you to go with him. <laughs> I got a spot for you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, just, I'll be that James. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Jim, oh, yeah, figures it was James. <laughs> Usually he's on my case. Now he's on yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My starters are all full for this season. I am I am booked out. I have all my people on all my charters through January. It doesn't mean I don't have people drop off. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and I think, look, you 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 fish with an incredible crew. Everybody on that in, in the group is an outstanding fisherman. You fish on the best boats with record catching captains consistently de delivering results across multiple species. It makes sense. It's going to be pretty tough to get on the boats that, that you guys are on. And uh, look, quite frankly, part of the reason that uh, that these boats are so successful is because they have fishermen like you guys that are on there too. You know, if Sully doesn't know how to land a big tog, Fishing Fever never has the big tog landed that day. Right. You know? on, on any given day, any person on that deck can be a hero. Yeah. There, there's no clowns on that deck. No clowns on that deck. There's nobody, there's nobody out there with their ugly stick or, you know, who's, you know, we're, we're running 30 miles offshore and who's throwing a one ounce jig. It's like, ah, uh, not only won't you get invited back, I'll tell you straight up, yo, bro, put your jig rod away. Ain't a place for that. Cause we're yeah. just not, we're just not going to play that. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll make sure if I ever get out there, I'll, I'll bring the appropriate gear. Don't worry as well. I I got it. I got a ride for you. I know a guy. Well, I was going to say, yeah, you, you, you should know if I make it out, I'm going to borrow that ride because I'm definitely going to want to try it. Definitely. I got a couple extras. No worries. I'll bring awesome. my ugly stick. Awesome. So with that guys, we're, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Frank, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, thank you to everybody that joined in the live stream tonight to watch uh, the chat. You know, it's great people in the chat talking and look, it's all about engagement, not just with us, but also with each other. So we've got people in there all up and down the coast, people, of Connecticut, uh, Tone Lee, Virginia with Adventures on the Water. I see people that I know from uh, New Jersey. We've got Delaware. We've got people down in Florida all over the place. So everybody, thank you for swinging by tonight and uh, checking out the talk. Frank, thanks again. Thank and everyone, you. we will see you next week with a, another live stream Monday night at 8 o'clock. Till next time, get tight out there, lines. get on the water, and get some tight lines.